rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you all for coming this morning. I'd like to remind everyone to silence their cell phones. I just had to do that myself. Um, meeting documents are available for your review down at the end next to Commissioner Heiberger. And please contact Craig or Carol if you are in need of a listening device this morning. Um, that takes us to routine business. Uh, first item is to consider a motion to approve the agenda. So move. Second. Motion to second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Uh, next item is I'd consider a motion to approve the commission meeting minutes from January 8th, 2019. Motion so to approve. Second. Motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Next item is to consider uh, bills to be paid in the amount of $3,652,059.95. Pay the bills. Second. Motion and a second. Any comments? Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Uh, there's a number of reports for your consideration this morning. Uh, first item is the Public Defender Advisory Board minutes. Second is the Register of Deeds Official Statement of Revenue Collected, December 2018. Highway Project Update and Mobile Crisis Team 2018 report. So I recommend all of those for your review. There's lots of interesting information in there. Uh, next item is personnel actions. Uh, first, I consider a motion to approve the routine personnel actions. Move for approval. Second. Motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. Uh, second is a briefing on the um, creation of a senior deputy state's attorney position. Good morning, Donna. Good morning. We are here today to brief you on a proposal to create a senior deputy state's attorney position on the 2019 state's attorney roster to be fully funded by the highway department and for the attorney to be dedicated to only handling highway matters. We are not here today seeking action today so I don't have a proposed resolution before you today I am here uh, simply to brief you and to address any comments or questions that you may have the need for this position exists due to the volume the magnitude uh, and the complexity of the legal matters that our office handles currently for the highway department Highway has a number of projects going into 2019 and thereafter uh, in which are time sensitive and need immediate legal attention. Uh, because of that and because Highway does indeed have funds available to pay for the position of a senior deputy state's attorney, uh, we are here uh, proposing that such a position be created. Uh, the attorney we would envision would be handling all of the right-of-way negotiations, all the acquisition negotiations on behalf of the county on the number of highway projects, again, for 2019 and going forward after 2019. So they'd be handling all of the, the right-of-way acquisition. If right-of-way acquisition negotiations uh, prove to not be fruitful, the attorney thereafter would be handling any condemnation proceedings in court and handle the preparation for trial and the trials themselves. They would handle all of contract reviews for highway, uh, so all their professional service agreements, any of their vendor contracts. They would provide legal assistance on RFPs and competitive bidding processes and provide all the legal support in that regard as well. They would also handle the array of other matters uh, that are handled by our office currently in regard to highway, uh, which would range anywhere from employment law to collections matters. Uh, so uh, that, that is the proposal to have the attorney handling those type of matters. Uh, the attorney we would, uh, that we would be seeking for the position would be an attorney that does uh, have 
uh, some years of experience uh, because we do not believe that this would be a position suitable for a new attorney to handle uh, because of the sophistication of the legal work that would need to be handled on behalf of the county, on behalf of highway. Uh, so again, the position itself would be funded by highway, so it would be budget neutral. It, uh, the highway department would uh, provide for the salary and benefits for this employee. Are there any questions or comments, anything that anyone has a question on? Commissioner Karski? First of all, we're not lawyering up for any legal action that we're taking, but it, so much of what the highway department does is so time sensitive with contracts and getting bids out and being able to process things um, so that we do get enter into a very you know, favorable and competitive bid environment is a lot of this. And help me with the numbers or correct me if I'm wrong, Donna, but the highway department already on a certain level reimburses for legal time that your office provides to the highway department, correct? They do. So they, they do contribute uh, a certain percentage uh, toward the salaries of the three deputy state's attorneys that are currently in the civil division of the state's attorney's office. We contemplate that that contribution um, though would would no longer be in effect uh, once this position is created. But currently, the highway department does provide a certain percentage toward the salaries of the deputy state's attorneys in the civil division. So that at some point, I don't know how many years ago, uh, the county did recognize that there is a certain need and volume originating out of highway and, and that so there was money allocated uh, toward the state's attorney's office that they reimbursed to the state's attorney's office to compensate for that high volume. Commissioner Heberger? A couple comments. One, we I think most of us know that the state's attorney's office space is at a premium and there is no space for this position. And so it's the thought is to house them full time at the highway department. And so then the supervision would still be the state's attorney's office, even though they are out housed at the highway department. Um, Aaron McGowan would be responsible for this district, this attorney. Excellent question, yes. So the attorney, we do uh, propose that the attorney actually be housed at the highway department. So the day-to-day -day work that these engineers are dealing with, that on a day-to-day -day basis, that attorney is right there with them to timely, quickly be able to address needs of an emergent or a nature and be able to provide that legal support without uh, having the attorney here at the at the uh, county building so the attorney would be situated over there uh, also keeping in mind that our office currently we're, we're without space to house that attorney so we do contemplate the attorney would would be uh, situated over at the highway department the attorney though would still fall under the chain of command of the state's attorney so the attorney is a deputy would be a deputy state's attorney uh, falling under uh, the authority of state's attorney McGowan okay. any other questions Commissioner Benninger. Uh, Donna, when we talked the last time, it was, you were going to pr look at a time study on how much time those three part-time persons were spending for the highway department and see if that was, <coughs> excuse me, an equivalent of a full-time person. Sure. And then the additional responsibilities that were being proposed by the highway superintendent about some other legal issues that needed to be caught up on. Can you give us an estimate? On, on how much time that may take? Well, in the time, uh, again, is always hard to, to estimate, but what I can tell you, and again, it's a great question, uh, what I can tell you is that uh, keeping internal statistics in our office as to the number of civil cases that we handled over a 16-month period of time, uh, there were, were approximately 1,238 uh, assignments, legal assignments that the three attorneys in the state's attorney's office fielded in that 16-month period of time, uh, and Highway uh, was accounted 
uh, uh, was our second largest client, our, our client that had uh, the second most assignments uh, generated after the county commission. So uh, the, the, there is a great deal of work that comes out of that is generated through that highway department. Uh, there, were, there were approximately 166 legal matters in that 16 month period of time that, that our office fielded for highway. Any other questions? We appreciate you bringing this briefing forward and providing this information to us, and we anticipate you'll be bringing a, a motion back. I shall. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, that takes us to um, item six, abatements. There are none. Um, item seven, notices and requests. There are none. Um, item eight, planning and zoning notices. There are none. And petitions, item nine, petitions for compromise of lien. There are none this time. So that takes us to an opportunity for public comment. Is there anyone here today that would like to comment about something that's not on the agenda? I don't see anybody racing to the podium. Uh, so that takes us uh, on to our regular business. And our first item is a briefing um, by Southeast Behavioral Health. Chris Graham, good morning. Good morning. Thank you for coming. Sure, thank you for having us. Um, as you can tell, I brought a group with. That doesn't mean that we'll be here all morning. We all have about two minutes to present on a couple new topics that Southeastern is involved with. But just to start off with, I wanna say thank you for your funding that helps Southeastern. We do receive about 169,000 from the county. This year, we provided back 6.8 million in services to the county. So. I do think you're getting your money's worth. How's that for what we receive? Our biggest increase we've found is in psychiatric care, which is almost at a million dollars. So that is something we're looking at. <clears throat> it's a necessity, but it's a very expensive cost too. So with that, um, I am gonna turn it over to uh, Kim Hansen, who's gonna talk about mobile crisis quickly. Good morning. morning. So I'm really just going to talk about our statistics this morning because I know that we have a limited amount of time. Um, in 2018, the mobile crisis team received 544 calls. Um, we responded to 506 of those calls. 38 were declined. 428 were first-time callers and our diversion rate continues to remain over 92%. Diversion meaning that person successfully remained at home without being involuntarily hospitalized. Um, this year, our numbers for males and females was right um, about the same, 253 and 252. Um, the highest number of callers are Caucasians um, and then we continue to remain in that 21 to 30 age group as our highest number of callers, with the 31 to 40 being the second highest, and that has stayed very consistent throughout the years. So about 38 of the 506 calls that we reported to did result in mental health holds. Um, you know, there is a time that people do need hospitalizations. Um, so that's actually a very good number. Um, and then as far as calls that we may decline, reasons for a decline would be if there is no probable cause for that person to be taken in on a mental illness hold. Um, if they don't meet probable cause, then we are not covered under the statute if the person is too violent or if there's weapons involved, if the person is too impaired to speak to mobile crisis, if they're impaired by drugs or alcohol to the point that they can't communicate with us, we would not respond to that call. If the person has overdosed or um, something else has happened where they need medical attention, then that would take priority over mobile crisis reporting to that call. And then on, um, Adolescents, if there is not a parent or legal guardian available to be there to give consent, we would not go out on that call. Are there any questions? Madam Chair. Commissioner Barton. So uh, <coughs> on those calls, uh, 
uh, were, were some number of them then uh, put in jail as opposed to uh, being admitted? Um, um, we do have another category, and that would be, you know, detox, children's in, jail. We very rarely see that somebody would actually go to jail. Um, the reason that that might happen would be if the hospital was at capacity and we're not accepting any more admits and that person was not, unab was not able to be safely left at home, then they may go to jail, but it's very rare. Commissioner Heiberger? Just a comment on history. <coughs> I think the mobile crisis team has been around about six or seven years, I think, and we started out with a smaller amount of time service and have expanded just because it has been incredibly successful in what we were hoping that it would provide and it has kept people out of jail and um, just been a really a money saver but also a lifesaver to a lot of people who who needed services that we weren't providing eight years ago so correct yes we started the team in 2011 and we had limited hours on weekends but very soon after we started we saw the need to expand to 24 7 and about two years ago, we expanded also into Lincoln County because of the way that, you know, the boundaries of Sioux Falls lie. So we were seeing a need for that as well. Commissioner Karski? You know, the idea of a <clears throat> mobile crisis team and what you have, it just seems like it's such a profound and great idea that it should have been around forever. Mm -hmm. If you weren't around, what would happen to all these calls? Right, um, that individual would go to the hospital on a mental illness hold. Um, law enforcement would just proceed with the petition and take the person to the hospital. And you know, a crisis is just a moment in time. So if you can give that person the opportunity to tell their story, to listen to them and come up with a satisfactory safety plan, they can remain at home and it's much less traumatic for them. They can go to work, remain with their families. And from what I understand from my work with the triage project, a three hour stay in the emergency room, which is probably where a lot of these people would end up, is about $6,000. And if you do the math, I mean, just the, um, and I hate to make it all just about the money, but what you're doing is saving, you know, the taxpayers of Minneapolis County just uh, a lot of money and helping people work through a tough moment in their lives. So, I mean, it just makes so much sense. So, thank you. Right, thank you. Any other, Commissioner Benega? Do uh, you still do some training with the uh, law enforcement staff on changes and upgrades, so to speak, of their educational process so they know how to handle those cases? Yes, and then twice a year, there is a crisis intervention training offered, and Southeastern plays a very large role in that training. It's a 40-hour course. For law enforcement. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other questions, Commissioner Barth? If a, a person has a family member who appears to be in crisis, what should they do? Call law enforcement. The mobile crisis team is activated by law enforcement. They report to the scene first, make sure that things are secure, that the person does meet probable cause, and then they page the mobile crisis team out. Okay. Commissioner Hyper, I have one more comment. Um, there isn't a charge to a family if the mobile crisis team is sent out. Is that this is paid for through Southeastern and through Minnehaha County and Lincoln County? Correct. There isn't correct. A, yes, so you don't are. get a bill in the mail if the mobile crisis team shows up at your door. Right. No, they're not billed at all. Um, we are reimbursed by the county. Yeah. Thank you. Anything else? Great information. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you morning. very much. Yeah. Good morning. My name is Celeste Uthie Bureau, and I am the Clinical Director of Childhood Education or Childhood Services and Family Services for Southeastern. And we've been very fortunate that we've been given a SAMHSA grant in um, September of this year, a $2.2 million grant in partnership with SDSU to provide services for a very underserved population, and that's our zero to five. Um, it also focuses on families and helping them to deal with any kind of conflict or as well as any kind of early childhood developmental difficulties that there are. Um, so with that, we were one of only nine awarded 
um, communities with this grant. And through this grant, what we're going to be able to provide is we're going to be able to do some screening services for children that have some developmental difficulties or that have experienced trauma and families within that realm. Um, part of those um, screenings that we will do will help us to assess what kind of level of distress they're in and what direction we need to take them in, as well as to take a look at what we're doing, is it effective? Um, part of that is also looking at play therapy and theraplay. And I want to just take a minute to just describe what that is. When you think of young children, especially pre-verbal, they can't tell us what's wrong. So a lot of times what happens, it's through that interaction with families and how they respond to them, as well as through their play, that they let us know where distress is and how we can help them develop normally as children. Um, we do parent education with that. And we're going to be, right now we're in 14 counties and we're going to be training a number of therapists on how to do this. That's a part of that training grant. Um, tomorrow alone, we have a group out of Washington, D.C. coming that's going to teach us how to diagnose as well as what to look for in children. So it's a wonderful service over five years that we'll be able to provide. And really, it's very interventive when you take a look at if we can get to work with these children when they're very young, just developing in those families, hopefully we can prevent a lot of services later on that won't be needed because they got that healthy start that they needed. So, Great. Any questions? Mr. Heiberger. I'm going to be full of them today. Sorry. Um, so this is a grant of $2.2 million over five years. Is right. there, I mean, I realize you've just started. So are there any thoughts on what we will do after five years or what Southeast will do after five years? Because if obviously if these programs are super successful, there wants to be some plan to move forward. So are there any thoughts on where you're going with that? Absolutely. Well, the nice part about this grant is that it opens up other opportunities through SAMHSA and other grant writing opportunities, as well as it's very well researched. So research is very interested in it. Um, we had um, some, uh, through our GPO that we have in Washington, D.C., um, we had some people from the um, Pediatric Association that were very interested in our study and wanted to know more about it and to tap into those resources. So hopefully we'll be able to expand and grow it from there, and those opportunities will open up just from the work that we do. Great. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Sure. Yes. Absolutely. absolutely. Please do. You know, we receive funding already called SED for children, and so when these children are identified, they can actually roll over, and over into our own funding. Mm -hmm. So a good question, but once we get the children and the families into services, they won't lose them once the grant's gone. Wonderful. So we have a funding source to follow. So that's, correct. that's yeah, it works well. Okay. I think we're ready for the next topic. So thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Debbie Fiani. I'm the care specialist and alternative sentencing worker for Southeastern that's been housed over at the Public Defenders. Um, as you know, to about two years ago, we entered into the program um, in an agreement with Minnehaha Public Defenders um, that we'd create an alternative sentencing program. This program provides clients with mental health and chemical dependency concerns um, with early intervention through referrals through community-based programs. Some of the benefits of this program has been increased re rehabilitation, reduced recidivism, um, increase the client's economic self-sufficiency, they get to keep their jobs, pay child support, keep their SSI benefits, their housing. It also reduced <coughs> costs of the incarceration of the county and the state by getting the person treatment versus incarceration. Um, in the last two years, we completed 347 evaluations. This includes mental health and chemical dependency evaluations. About half of the evalua evaluations were done in the jail in which we support other agencies as needed. In 2018 alone, we had 161 referrals. Of those referrals, we had 107, uh, 107 of them had evaluations, which led to about 32% of them receiving services through Southeastern Directions for Life, either through our care program or through um, outpatient services. So when um, I'm Karen with uh, adult services at Southeastern, so when Debbie is able to find that they meet criteria for serious mental illness, that opens an array of services for these individuals. That includes case management at our Fifth Street location. The case managers can help them find all kinds of resources, get them to appointments, those sorts of things. We also have uh, seven psychiatric residents who are able to see these clients, provide medication, and we have medication management through our
pharmacy that's located at Fifth Street. Um, we are able to include them in group therapy in our CD program where they can be involved in uh, recovery support groups. We also have an employment portion um, at our adult program where individuals can go through courses for employment and be set up and matched with employment that is available. We also have a benefit specialist at Fifth Street which is an individual who can help people get um, SSI or SSDI if they are eligible. And I also wanted to talk about um, a grant that we got recently. Uh, we're pretty heavily involved with our specialty courts here in Minnehaha County. And um, through uh, a partnership with South Dakota Housing, we just recently received a $300,000 grant for two years that's going to help us in um, getting people housed, people with a, a felony on their record who might not normally be able to get into housing. We can um, help them with the rent for up to three months. We can guarantee if there's gonna be damages after their stay there that we can repair that. So just wanted to make the commission, commissioners aware of re this recent um, money that we got to help people with housing. Thank you, Karen. Just for purposes of our minutes, could you please give your full name? Oh, sorry, Karen Chesley. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Are there any questions for Karen? We really appreciate you coming this morning and all the work that you guys do throughout our community. It's great to have you come in and remind us of, of, of all the things that are available for people. Sometimes you hear about what's not available, but um, because of you, there are a lot of services available for folks in our community, so we thank you very much. Commissioner Heiberger? I have one more follow-up co comment, and that was just about the public defender's liaison. Um, that happened, I believe, two years ago, and I was on, a, um, oh, on their advisory board. Public defenders. Oh yeah, I was on their I was on their liais I was their liaison at that time when they came in, and actually Minnehaha County is not paying for that service. Southeast Behavioral has come in and offered that service to us at no extra expense, and it was something we had talked about, at least on our liaison board about that you know it would be great to have a social worker in our office, and then here Southeast came in and provided it, and it has been another very valuable service that we've been able to offer, that helps you get people connected. So just thanks for thanks for continuing to help us out. So. Commissioner Karski. I don't know the right place or right time, but just a shout out. Um, yep. Debbie, I, you have a little program coming up in a, next week. Do you have extra invitations? I do. Uh, for the rest of the commission. We got some this morning through the Public Defender's Office, so if you could leave some, that would be great. I will send some. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you again for coming this morning. Uh, that takes us to item 11. Um, it's uh, to authorize the Minnehaha County Sheriff's Office to purchase a 2019 Grand Caravan under the state bid contract. Good morning, Lieutenant Good McGovern. Good morning, I'm Mike McGovern, I'm a lieutenant in the jail. <laughs> uh, jail budgeted $23,050 for 2019 for a new transport vehicle for our fleet. Uh, and the state bid for from Wagner Auto and Pier is $22,464. That includes the base price as well as power driver seat and lumbar support. Uh, this vehicle will be used for warrant pickups, uh, for transporting inmates to outside appointments, and we're going to be replacing the current vehicle that's not in service due to uh, having a blown engine, which that vehicle will more than likely go to surplus this year. Okay. Motion questions? to approve. Second. Just motion and a second. Were there any comments? Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Oh, sorry, roll call vote. I even have my finger on the thing that says I'm supposed <laughs> to say roll call vote. Olivia. Heiberger? Yes. Benega? Aye. Karski? Aye. Barth? Aye. Bender? Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Thank, Thank you, you very much. It takes us to item 12 to authorize the highway department to purchase two message boards off of the Minnesota State bid contract. DJ Boothy. Good morning, Commissioner. DJ Boothy, Highway Superintendent. <coughs> uh, I have a request today before you to purchase two message boards off the Minnesota State bid. Uh, each message board would be $21,922. Uh, the reason for the request is uh, we're hoping to replace two message boards that were initially purchased in 2012. Uh, those two message boards uh, currently do not have radar capabilities, which is uh, sir, or a, a feature that we regularly use on our, on our message boards. It is able to record uh, for traffic counting information and also report on the display itself uh, to report people's speed for uh, traffic calming services. 
And then also uh, the other feature that we would like that this one does not have is mobile programming. Uh, the newer message boards come with a modem that connects to a satellite and we're able to program that uh, via our cell phone or laptop computer or desktop computer. Uh, the two message boards that we are uh, proposing to replace have an estimated surplus value of $10,000. There is a local government here in Minnehaha County that's interested in uh, purchasing these once they're declared surplus. And so uh, the effective net purchase for these would be about $11,000 a piece uh, for the new message boards. I'll stand by for any questions. Commissioner Heiberger. Just going to bring up some of the comments I had to yesterday, GJ. We um, texted back and forth on this. and. Um, my, my question was, and DJ answered him, but I just want to talk about it publicly, is, is you know, the, the value of these message boards is still $10,000 a piece. And to, you know, to replace them, you know, it's still $11,000 each. But to upgrade them to where they would be like the current, like the new message boards is about thirty-five. I can't remember for sure, $3,500. $3, yeah. So, and DJ said it's like a new computer, but part of me is like, if we can put a new hard drive in it and it's working great which isn't a hard drive I realize that I'm just going with your same analogy for three thousand dollars as opposed to another twenty thousand dollars why are we doing this and so I just wanted to have the conversation and I, that's where I'm at if you want to maybe give those numbers that you gave and that I asked I you can, about. I can grab them they're at my chair yeah, and I have them too here under the desk I should have wrote them on a piece of paper I apologize so that's my question is why are we spending you know an extra twenty thousand dollars if we can upgrade the two that we have and maybe that's a bad question I, I think it's a fair question so uh, the additional features on the old message boards uh, <laughs> to upgrade the old message boards would would cost three thousand one hundred and eighty three dollars each and so uh, I said it would be about ten thousand dollars net uh, to purchase uh, the new message boards uh, based off of the purchase price and the uh, salvage value and then in order to upgrade them another thirty two hundred dollars and so we'd be looking at about sixty eight hundred dollars that we'd be looking at saving and and my response I, I do think it is a fair question we we obviously did look at that before we made this request um, once the message boards become a certain age and you never really know when it is because they're out in the elements and so it changes uh, depending on on each message board but uh, they start having issues with their batteries and it has a six pack of batteries and so uh, it's pretty expensive to replace the battery packs and then uh, uh, the uh, the LED panels themselves uh, they start going out the bulbs start going out and they need replacement and so they it gets pretty expensive and, and labor-intensive for our mechanic staff our mechanic staff is always short-staffed and especially right now it's very short-staffed and so uh, that's why we were making the request for uh, replacing them hopefully not having to worry about the maintenance, the extra maintenance that, that would come along with the boards. And just a follow-up comment. And th those were questions that you had answered in your email, but we hadn't got as far as the battery packs were not replaced for that $3,100 and that the LED light panels were also not being replaced for that amount of money. So that just clarifies more of the messages we were going back forward. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Are there questions, Commissioner Barth? I just would comment that uh, let's make sure that no one can hack into these things, you know, uh, through Wi-Fi or whatever. Uh, and if you see my picture on one of them on the highway, <laughs> I didn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> these these can program a custom uh, art piece, and so maybe we'll Keep work them on secure. that. Keep secure. To the highest bidder. Yeah. <laughs> other questions for DJ Commissioner Benega uh, DJ the person or group that's buying the uh, salvaged boards if you will do you have any idea what they're using them for and why are they so willing to pay that much for a, something that is quote salvage at 50% right. of its original value I do know that right now this agency does not own any message boards uh, it's a pretty standardized price when uh, when you go you uh, when you have a construction project and you have to rent these, they're about $1,000 per each per week. Mm -hmm. And so uh, they, don't have, they don't own any right now. They do rent them during certain construction projects in, in their area. And, uh, and so I don't think that the, uh, the payback period or the buyback period would be very long for them if they were to own two of them. And, and they do want to do more messages, public outreach type messages, uh, in addition to the, just their construction projects. And so... Uh, they have a new staff person that I think is, is very interested in using them as public outreach. I would just comment, I think 
fifty percent of of a purchase price for salvage value is pretty high. I don't usually see anything close to that in any kind of trade-in or salvage cost, if you will. So I think they have a lot of value to them yet. Any other comments, questions? Move approval. Second. A motion and a second. I take a roll call vote. Seneca? No. Karski? Yes. Farth? Aye. Heiberger? No. Fender? Aye. Motion passes three to two. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that takes us to item 13, the legislative update and proposed legislation. Uh, Craig Dewey. Good morning, Craig Dewey, Commission Office. The 2019 legislative session has uh, gotten underway as of last week. Uh, bills are continuing to drop every day. Uh, one update on this memo, uh, Senate Bill 7 was killed unanimously in committee yesterday. Uh, that is included on your memo. Uh, and uh, the auditors across the state uh, had made calls to different legislators uh, in an attempt to uh, kill that bill, which was successful. I'd be happy to uh, answer uh, any other questions, though, you have about uh, these few bills. And then I have another uh, update regarding uh, a potential bill that uh, could be coming before the legislature. Any questions? For Craig, do you want to go ahead and give the update? All right. The next bill that we have uh, in front uh, uh, of us here uh, is a bill that uh, uh, Commissioner Barth and Senator Wayne Steinhauer from the Hartford area had uh, been in conversation about, and uh, it deals with uh, uh, creating the authority for imposing a civil penalty of $50 for each day of an ordinance violation, and uh, that money uh, could be uh, established or that fine could be established by the county and then uh, uh, the monies collected would be deposited into the county general fund uh, as is uh, practice with uh, past pieces of legislation uh, as far as uh, the commission taking steps to uh, approve uh, uh, position uh, for or against uh, a bill I wanted to bring this before you to get your thoughts and input on it uh, Commissioner Barth as well if you have uh, any uh, comments about uh, some of the background of the discussions uh, I'd invite those if I might speak. madam chair um, Wayne uh, tells, or Senator uh, Steinhauer tells me that uh, this uh, provision actually existed uh, from 1967 to 1982 and was repealed in 1982. We don't know exactly why. But as you know, we had uh, a lengthy problem with uh, uh, one of the junkyards over by uh, Hartford, and we really had no sanction until we were finally able to get an injunction uh, through the state's attorney's office to have them cease operations. And uh, it was a uh, burr under the saddle for the, the, the town of Hartford and their chamber and even the neighbors in the Brower subdivision. And this would, and we wouldn't have to impose this uh, fine. And it's the kind of thing I think we could forgive if they made a good faith effort to clear it up. But right now we don't have uh, the the power to uh, sanction them uh, in a in a in a quick manner and uh, uh, Senator uh, Steinhauer uh, uh, feels the pain. Commissioner Heiberger, I've just a couple of questions that have come to light. Jeff and I have talked a little bit about this too. Um, who's going to be collecting the money? How are you going to enforce the collection? And, you know, is it going to go on somebody's tax bill because then it would be easier to enforce, but are you going to have somebody that runs up $5,000 worth or, you know, that'd be a lot, but even $500 and $50 fees, and then how are you going to enforce the collection of it? And then if we're going to fo forgive it, it's like, I think I, I'm just, I would be really curious as to why it was repealed in the first place. I mean, if, if it's easy to say, oh, we're going to put a $50 fine on you, but if the guy doesn't pay it in any way, how are we going to enforce it? Are we going to have the sheriff come out, sheriff come out and, you know, and, and serve papers on them? And then is it going to go in the courts? And are we going to add more costs to the county by the expenses? I'm just asking questions because I honestly don't know either. Um, are we going to add more expenses in the end as we try to prosecute somebody who didn't pay a $150 fine? I don't know. I don't know the answers to those questions. So, and I don't know questions? why it was repealed. No, I'd ask the same question. I mean, there's obviously a reason if it was repealed in 1982. It seems like that wasn't that long ago that that information should be um, 
be able to be discovered. And so it would be helpful before we made a decision on whether we support or don't support this bill to have some of that information, um, you know, whether there's things that we're not actually foreseeing um, that led to the bill being repealed. Commissioner Karski? I guess I'm not you know, under the impression that we're being asked to support it or not support it, but I, it, it's very interesting questions. I, I'm, I'm thinking to myself, well, this ought to be interesting to see how this plays out and how, I mean, this is a statewide issue, how our legislators ask the same questions if they do and how that all happens. I appreciate the information and I wouldn't be ready to, you know, throw my weight behind supporting it or opposing it, but I, it is an interesting conversation and um, I know that when it comes to code enforcement issues specifically, we do have, I mean, other than the weight of, um, saying we're going to clean it up for you and send you a bill. Um, this might add a little bit, but, you know, the logistics of enforcement are going to be intriguing, to say the least. So mm -hmm. interested to see how this plays out. If, if I might, on a slightly different subject, I was contacted yesterday by another uh, state senator um, about, uh, um, well, it was Stace Nelson, um, contacted me about making the state responsible for uh, defending uh, uh, inmates in uh, state uh, penitentiary uh, penal institutions who commit crimes there. As you know, when we had the uh, murder of uh, Mr. Johnson at our penitentiary, we paid for the defense. Well, apparently the area where uh, Senator Nelson represents uh, where, where Springfield is they had like 23 prisoners caught with marijuana, and I don't think there's 23 lawyers there uh, at this point. And so it's a, it's a, a biting issue for uh, mm -hmm. uh, his yeah, constituents. Sure. And uh, for whatever reason, he decided to contact me about it. Okay. Um. Thank you for the direction on the bill. I will continue to work with Commissioner Barth in terms of uh, uh, answering those questions that you are uh, seeking touch answers to. Okay. Thank you very much, Greg. Okay. That takes us to item 14, liaison reports. Are there any liaison reports this morning? I have several. Commissioner Barth. Go ahead. Um, first of all, the, um, the museum was the recipient of a $15,000 mm. grant from the Mary Chilton chapter of the DAR. They're going to use it for shelving at the new facility. Um, Heartland House, uh, I'm liaison uh, to the uh, ICAP, and they're going to do their annual fundraiser on uh, February 21st. I've told them that we would uh, uh, get a table there, and uh, I think I don't expect the county to pay for it. I expect us to pay for it, and if worse comes to worse, I'll pay for it. Um, then uh, I guess another item is uh, the East Dakota Water District. I've been going to their meetings for some time. Well, I was just elected to their board of directors. Um, you show up enough and suddenly you <laughs> got it. And uh, last night I went to uh, uh, the uh, Minnehaha Conservation District meeting along with our state's attorney representative who was there. Uh, and. Uh, it's interesting to f see uh, which parts of the federal government are operating and which parts aren't. And uh, uh, it's uh, currently you cannot sign up for CRP uh, acres. Currently uh, you cannot get your wetlands uh, assessed. Uh, but there are other parts of the Ag Department that are still functioning. And it's, uh, it's a little bit chaotic, it seems to me. Um, but. Um, it was a good meeting last night. Thank you. Congratulations on being elected to the board. We appreciate your service. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner Karski. Last week um, on the 8th, Tuesday, we had the detox advisory board meeting. Um, no large revelations there. Uh, everything's going well, functioning as we need it to. Um, I did request information that I haven't received yet, but when I do receive it, basically on um, how many people are in detox for the different um, chemical reasons, whether it be alcohol, meth, uh, marijuana, opioids, et cetera. So I'm looking forward to that information and 
And when we see that, I'll forward that on to everybody. Uh, this morning we had a meeting of the Public Defender's Advisory Board, Commissioner uh, Bender and I. Um, they came in at 99% of their budget, so financially they're in good shape. We talked about policies and procedures for um, um, conflict cases where they have to, how they determine if it's a conflict or not. And the process has become somewhat automated to the, um, you know, as a good management tool, I thought, um, to determine if conflict, conflict exists within the office or um, between clients so that they can make sure the proper attorney is assigned from the proper organization so that it doesn't get 90% of the way to a court trial and, oh, we have a co conflict, we can't do this one anymore. So it's um, been a learning process and it's becoming automated. Um, I think Tracy Smith's doing a great job with using that tool, something she um, has been using and she's gonna, we encourage her to um, talk to others potentially about what she does and maybe it can be refined or, or shared with other organizations. Um, and then also, they had a walkthrough from uh, Doug Blomker from Emergency Management, Mark Krenz from our um, facilities, and they're going to be making some changes over there for security and that type of thing, and um, for handicap accessibility entrance. And um, Tracy thought it was a great thing to do to bring them in, and they, she really valued the input they had, and they're going to be implementing things at a very minimal cost to um, for staff security and just for public service Great. thank you madam chair this is a, just I guess a, a question uh, are we going to uh, post the liaison assignments or uh, you know it should be uh, I don't know if it's out in public though is oh. what I'm that was what my I'm question saying. too and uh, maybe uh, we could have a press release or something I don't know if that's what we want to do but something like that um, is that a public record Carol Thank you, Carol. Good morning, Carol Muller, Commission Office. Yes, liaison assignments were sent out to department heads this morning, and uh, there's certainly public information. We certainly distribute that to people that, that have, and for those people who are listening and wondering what we're all talking about, uh, the five of you as commissioners get a lot of assignments during the year. For instance, all of the departments and offices um, have a liaison within Minneapolis County. If you do funding outside for an agency, <coughs> there's a liaison um, with that particular avenue. Plus there are several that um, Metro Council, I would use as, as an example. Um, and then there's catch-alls of some others that exist. We also do the chair is always the liaison to the Sioux Falls area community or Chamber of Commerce. Uh, we've got the development foundations. I've never added them up, but it's probably about 40 or so <laughs> that are out there. It's pretty, it's very significant. Yes, if I may. So uh, th then they need to be updated on the website as well, right? I mean, uh, you know, I don't know that they've ever been put on there, but we will make sure we do that. That they have. If you click under mm -hmm. a commissioner, it, it lists uh, your uh, liaison assignments, your hmm. duties. Yeah. Okay. Well, we can certainly check on that and make sure that that's we'll follow updated. up on that. Okay. Thank you. Any other liaison reports? If not, uh, item 15, new business. Are there, is there any new business today? If not, item 16, old business, Commissioner Karski. Old business, a little bit of an uh, update, I guess, on the triage, and I'm going to be really shallow on the details um, because there's going to be a lot of information coming. But last Thursday, the mayor and myself and Aaron Serska from our staff met, and we had a conversation with a an expert, I guess, a national expert on bringing them in, and it's going to be funded through some of our health court care organizations, um, significant funding from them to bring this person in to take the work of the policy committee and, um, you know, conceptually all the things that we've decided what a triage, pro a triage center should look like and build the blueprint so that we can open the doors. You know, we have a definite time frame. We have specified... Um, requirements of what this expert, this um, champion is going to do for us. Um, there will be more information coming. We're going to be funding it through, like I said, using um, the mayor graciously volunteered 
to um, have it run through his legal staff for the contract and the funding to go through the health care through the city's budget so that we can make this all work. Um, I didn't fight him on that. I thought it was nice of him <laughs> to offer. So, um, so we'll be seeing. You'll be seeing and hearing a lot more about it. But this gives us a, a very definite time frame. We're not spinning our wheels. This is going to move the project forward, and um, all very positive. And um, you'll, um, I think, like the outcome. Just going to add a really quick comment to that and that there are phases that the pro that the triage center has been um, working through and I think this is kind of the beginning of, of phase three kind of the end of two beginning of three kind of in there I was just reading a report on it last night and so the beginning of the beginning of making it yeah open yeah. <laughs> it's getting yeah. there we're at the end of the beginning of, of the planning <laughs> so yeah <laughs> Well, thank you. I appreciate that. I mean, the triage projects is obviously a lot something that uh, you and a lot of um, commissioners and others have put a lot of work into, and um, I think there's widespread agreement that it's a great idea. We just um, all look forward to getting uh, the I's dotted and the T's crossed and, and getting it operationalized. So thank you for that report. Any, anything else? Mr. I just want to make a comment about <clears throat> last week we were uh, briefed on some IT related issues with um, tax distributions and payments and I do know for a fact that IT the auditor's office the treasurer's office worked extremely hard in getting this problem solved and they have done an excellent job of almost concluding all those processes so I, I appreciate the extra effort that they have put into this point to make that work. I would certainly echo that. I know that it was, it was done in what seemed like record time. Um, from the report we got on Tuesday, I think you had that all solved by Thursday. So yep. thank you very much. So Incredible turnaround to make it happen. So thank you. Okay, anything else in old business? We have no executive session today, so I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second. Motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes <coughs> unanimously. Thank you.